My favorite moment in movie history was from Jurassic Park. That moment when the mightiest predator who ever strode on Earth appeared. The Tyrannosaurus Rex. I can tell you, back then, 10 years old, I was terrified. But I froze to my seat because earlier in that movie, the scientist, Dr. Grant, told us that it would be movement the T-Rex would react to. But what if I tell you now that it wasn't the character's movements that caught the T-Rex's attention? No, it was sound. The crying of the kids in the crashed car, or the scientists shouting to distract the huge carnivore. I didn't know this back then, but I know now because part of my job as a neuroscientist is to investigate how dinosaurs listen to and locate sound sources. Yes, dinosaurs are still around us. So let me show you the T-Rex of our time. Okay, I admit not exactly a T-Rex. When I tell my friends' kids that I'm a dinosaur scientist, they are also quite disappointed when they find out that I'm working with chicken. But this one is a bit closer. Also a predator, a barn owl, homing in on its prey, only using its sense of hearing. Yes, birds are considered living dinosaurs. And there are also other ancient critters still around us and closely related to dinosaurs that teach us how they listen to sounds, like alligators. But now you probably ask, why would we care how dinosaurs locate sound sources? And imagine you hear a T-Rex roaring somewhere in the distance. I guess you might want to know in which direction to run, right? But seriously, it can be very important for us humans to precisely locate the source of a sound. For example, you sit in your car and you hear an ambulance. You'll effortlessly know where it will come from way before you see it. Or you are at a cocktail party and someone wants to talk to you while others are chatting around you. That's only possible if you can precisely locate that voice in the noisy room. Yes, we can observe and test human behaviors, especially at a cocktail party. But the problem is we cannot look deep into the brain circuits underlying the sensory processes. And that is where modern dinosaurs, such as the barn owl or the chicken or the alligator come into play, because we can study their brains in detail and use them as models for human sound location. First, again, by observing their behavior, and then by inferring and testing models of how their brain computes where sound comes from. And because there are similarities across all brains that evolved in the past millions of years, these models will help us understand how our brain processes sounds. And the knowledge we gain here can be applied to help patients with hearing loss who need cochlear implants or other hearing aids to improve their hearing. Current implants make it hard to localize sound sources, especially in noisy environments like at that cocktail party I just talked about. Understanding the inputs to the brain, the sensory inputs, and how these cues are processed by actual neural networks will make these implants better. But look, let's look at a concrete example. The barn owl has been subject of studies that helped us understand sound source localization. Famous ornithologist and neuroscientist Mark Konishi observed these predators while they were catching mice in pure darkness. And he found they have superb hearing. Their hearing threshold is actually close to thermal noise, which means they can hear that mouse rustling under a layer of leaves or snow, even if the bird is sitting further away on a branch of a tree. But what were the cues the owl used to not only detect the noises made by their prey, but also to locate 
the mouse. And they do this by some computation based on how fast sound arrives at their ears. Let's say that mouse is somewhere in the right periphery. Now, sound travels with a speed of about 340 meters per second. And now the sound of that mouse will arrive at the right ear first after traveling around the head, only reaching then the left ear. And then this delay is called interaural time difference, or ITD in short. And these ITDs are zero if the sound is coming exactly from the front, so the sound waves hit the ears at the same time. And they are longest or maximal if the sound is coming exactly from the right or exactly from the left. And we humans have in common with the barn owl that we also have two ears. And if you wear stereo headphones right now, you would hear me talking to your right just because we played the sound from the right earphone a tiny bit earlier than from the left earphone. But these delays are short, very, very short. Imagine this talk would have been held in a large auditorium and you sit in the last row. Then my voice would travel about 50 to 100 milliseconds before it reaches your ears. But the distance between your ears is much smaller, right? So ITDs must certainly be shorter than that. So again, a sound coming from the right hits the right ear first and then travels 600 microseconds around your head before it reaches the left ear. And because the head of a barn owl is much smaller, it only takes 250 microseconds to travel from one ear to the other. That is shorter than a blink of an eye. But what is even more astonishing is that the barn owl and we humans can detect ITDs as short as 10 microseconds, which means we can locate the source of a sound with a resolution of less than five degrees in space. And this is what helps the barn owl find and catch that mouse, or the T-Rex find those poor kids in the car. And also at that cocktail party, it helps us find that person that wants to talk to us in the crowd. ITD is what helps us find them. But how does the brain detect these minute delays? And that is actually quite simple and can be explained by a neural network that receives input from the left and right ears. And these neural signals must conserve the temporal structure of a sound so you can compare the timing of action potentials generated at the left and right ears. And these action potentials must travel along delay lines before they reach neurons that only respond if they perceive input simultaneously from the left and right side. And these so-called coincidence detector neurons are spatially arranged to systematically receive inputs from delay lines with different length. And a certain ITD is then encoded by the place of that neuron that receives exactly input from the delay line that compensates for the external ITD. And we call this a map because the spatial distribution of excitation within the network reflects the direction of sound. Simply speaking, a map means cues that are similar are located closer together in the brain and cues that are different like two sounds, one from the right and one from the left, are located farther away from each other in the brain. So, to test this model, we neuroscientists lowered metal electrodes into the brains of the anesthetized animals and positioned these electrodes close to the assumed coincidence detector neurons. And then we simultaneously play sounds from earphone speakers, basically like those earbuds you might be wearing right now, and recorded the action potential response of that neuron. And then we also varied the time difference of sounds we played from the right and left speaker and see how the 
action potential response, in, in response increases or decreases. And then we repeated this process for multiple neurons at multiple locations in the network. And we actually found out that in the chicken, in the barn owl, and the alligator, ITDs are systematically placed in a neural map. Again, that neural map is a projection of the auditory space around the animal, meaning different locations in the map respond to different locations of sound directions. And because there are two brain hemispheres, two maps exist, each of which covers a different portion of the auditory space. Sounds coming from the right have stronger representation in the left brain hemisphere and sounds coming from the left have stronger representation in the right hemisphere. And there's some overlap for frontal space. But of course, sensory processing does not end there. The brain extracts frequency, volume, motion, and also mix it with experience. Was it really a mouse or was it just the wind that whirled up a few leaves? And then eventually translates this spatial percept into a behavioral response. And then the owl strikes. So I told you how modern dinosaurs use neural maps to locate sound sources. Sound localization might not exactly work like this in humans, but learning how ITD and sound location are processed by different brains in different species, like those of birds and alligators, will increase our understanding of the complexity of sensory networks in the brain. Over the past century, we have learned a lot about the brain. And we have developed increasingly advanced techniques to explore its structures and functions. And new findings will open up more possibilities for those who suffer from brain diseases or sensory impairments. But we will gain this knowledge through comparative studies of behavior and neural circuits in different species, like those modern dinosaurs. And this will be essential to understand how we sense the world and how we interact with it. Thank you.